Before the video starts, make sure to visit my Instagram page and my Twitter page. Also, I just opened up a shop on Redbubble, Mad Cat Mech Shop, where I sell mecha-themed merch. The inventory is not much, but more artwork will be added soon. 20 years ago, a movie was released in theaters based on one of the most recognizable video game franchises, Resident Evil. This created a film franchise throughout the years, with the last one, Resident Evil The Final Chapter, being released back in 2016. This will be an in-depth look into the film and see how it managed to kick off a film franchise. The rights to make a movie were bought by German film company Constantine Film, and had brought in Alan B. McElroy, who wrote screenplays for Halloween 4 and Spawn. His script for the adaptation was described as being action horror packed and violent. There are some noticeable changes from the video game. For example, there is no umbrella or stars. Instead, it's about a special forces team that are sent into a mansion to search for a SWAT team that went missing. That special forces team are actually made up of the original characters, such as Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine. The script included a lot of the Resident Evil classics, such as the mutated dogs, giant wasps, and of course, zombies. The script, unfortunately, was rejected. The late George A. Romero was brought in to write up a new script. The game's director, Shinji Mikami, is a big fan of Romero's movies and was inspired by them. George had directed a live-action commercial promoting Resident Evil 2 back in 1998. He said how he wanted to make the commercial like a movie. This is a commercial for uh, Biohazard 2, but we wanted it to look like a movie, so we basically wanted to produce it very much like a movie instead of uh, like a this impressed the studio so much so they brought him on board for the film. The draft does follow the plot more closely, although there are some odd choices made. For one, both Chris and Jill are romantically involved, and Chris wasn't even a part of Stars. He's a farmer in this. Albert Wesker in this is pretty much a jerk right off the bat, and at one point bombs are placed all over the mansion and are connected to a heart rate monitor inside of him. If he dies, well, the bombs go off, killing everyone else. Other Stars members like Kenneth, Richard, and Forrest all play a bigger part in the story. Also, there are some new characters added in, such as Rosie Rodriguez, who coincidentally seem a lot like Michelle Rodriguez's character in the actual movie. Rosie seemed to have an obsession with living everywhere, spouting it off like a catchphrase. Ada Wong also shows up in this, despite being introduced in Resident Evil 2, playing the role of an umbrella scientist. Ultimately, the script was rejected. As you can see, there was a bit of a pattern when it came to the production of this movie. Drafts would be written up and rejected. The job would eventually land at the feet of Paul W.S. Anderson. Having directed both Event Horizon and Mortal Kombat, the studio figure he would be perfect for the job. Anderson himself had written up a script titled Undead, which involved a mansion, underground laboratories, and genetic experiments. He rewrote the script in 2000 and included some elements from the original script and the games. It was renamed Resident Evil Ground Zero, which was the original title for the movie. Filming began in early 2001. The first half of the film was made in Berlin. Filming locations included many unfinished train stations, such as the Bainhof Bundestag here. For the ending where it takes place in downtown Raccoon City, it was filmed in downtown Toronto. Shooting there had to be postponed due to the terrorist attack on 9-11. Paul Anderson said this had a huge impact on him and had removed the Ground Zero subtitle out of respect for the victims. For the cast, instead of using the original characters from the games, new characters are introduced, being that this is a new storyline. For the lead, we have Mila Jovovich, who plays Alice, a person with a mysterious past waking up with amnesia inside of a mansion situated above the Hive, a top secret science facility. Mila starred in The Fifth Element and Joan of Arc. She's familiar with the games as she played with them with her brother Marco. Mila was on set for 16 hours a day, most of it spent doing her own stunts, such as jumping in and out of freezing water. And one time, Mila sustained actual injuries while filming the train scene where she held on to the metal grate here. For example, in the closing sequence where she's fighting the creature, she's like getting crashed all over the place, she's rolling around, she's on bare metal gratings, getting dragged across them. At the end of the movie, her character, Alice, is covered in bruises and cuts. And i got to tell you, you know, those cuts and bruises, they're not makeup. You know, they're there for real. That's how she ended up at the end of the film. 
One memorable scene was where she was being chased by one of the infected dogs, running against this wall and kicking it. Mila spent three months training for that stunt. During filming, she struck up a relationship with Paul, and the two got married in 2009. Colin Salmon plays James One Shade, leader of the team sent into the Hive. He starred in Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough. He also stars in TV shows such as Silent Witness and Krypton. Colin would work with Paul once again on Alien vs. Predator and even starred in Resident Evil Retribution. Michelle Rodriguez plays as Rain, the hot-headed member of the team. Michelle was also familiar with the games and wanted to star in the movie, so much so she told her agent to call the studio the minute the movie was greenlit. Michelle is a familiar face in the Fast and the Furious franchise. She had also started the TV show Lost. She too would return in Resident Evil Retribution. James Pierfoy plays Spence, Alice's supposed partner who also has amnesia, though there may be more to his story than meets the eye. James had starred in TV shows before making the leap to movies. One famous example is A Knight's Tale that starred the late Heath Ledger. Also to note, his character's name Spence is a callback to the Spencer Mansion from the original Resident Evil game. Eric Mabus plays Matthew, a cop seeking information on Umbrella's illegal activities. He gets detained by the team and is brought along. Eric starred in The Crow Salvation, but is best known for starring in the TV film series Signed, Sealed, Delivered. The movie begins with this intro and narration, explaining how Umbrella is the world's biggest conglomerate, and that they're involved in military technology, bioweaponry, and genetic experiments. We get a zoom in shot of the individual storing away both the T-Virus and the cure in a case and stealing it. Tossing one of the vials releasing the virus, it quickly spreads throughout the ventilation. The Red Queen, an AI that monitors the facility, locks down everything and kills everyone to contain the outbreak. We then cut to Alice waking up naked in a shower. She doesn't remember much of anything. After getting dressed, she explores around the mansion a bit until an unknown person grabs her and the Umbrella Strike Team bursts in. The man, Matthew, is revealed to be working for the Raccoon City Police Department. Both are taken along underground, where they find a train. While on the train, they find Spence hiding inside and also suffering from memory loss. James explains both of them are actually employees of Umbrella and both are partners assigned to guard the Hive's secret entrance operating under the cover of a married couple. Upon reaching the command center where the Red Queen is located, they attempt to unlock the system but her defenses activates as James and three other members enter this hallway where a laser grid is activated and killing all of them. The others are shocked but need to complete the mission. The Red Queen appears in the form of a holographic little girl. She warns them not to shut off the system but Kaplan ignores her and shuts off the power. Doing this unlocks all the cells releasing the zombies and also the infamous liquor. Rain gets bitten as the group is surrounded. Another member of the team gets killed. Rain, Kaplan, and Spence manages to get away as Alice and Matthew are separated from them. Alice regains some of her memories back. Matthew is trying to find his sister, Lisa. She shows up zombified. He's almost killed but is saved by Alice. It's revealed that Lisa infiltrated Umbrella to smuggle out evidence of their illegal experiments. Alice remembers she was Lisa's contact in the Hive. They all regroup and decide to reactivate the Red Queen. They're told they only have one hour before the whole facility goes into lockdown, so now it's a race against time to escape. Along the way, Rain's condition is getting worse and Kaplan gets separated from the group. The group makes it to the labs where Alice fully remembers her past. Turns out it was Spence who was responsible for the outbreak. He escapes and locks the rest in. At the train station, the liquor kills him and it mutates into something much more deadly. Kaplan all of a sudden shows up. Together they head back to the train, boarding it. Rain is injected with the cure. All of a sudden the mutated liquor ambushes them, taking out Kaplan. As Alice pins down the monster, Rain has turned into a zombie as she was too far gone for the cure to work. Matthew shoots her, causing her to fall against the button, releasing the door beneath the monster. Matthew himself, unfortunately, has been scratched and is probably infected. As they leave, Matt's arm begins to mutate. Before Alice could administer the cure, Umbrella scientists subdued the two. One of the scientists, played by Jason Isaacs, informs the others to place Matt into the Nemesis program. A reference to the tyrant Nemesis, Alice is placed in quarantine under observation. Sometime later, Alice wakes up in a white, sterile room, 
on an observation table, pulling out the IV needles out of her. She uses one of them to get the door open and finds that the hospital is abandoned. As she leaves, it turns out the virus has spread across Raccoon City, leading to a cliffhanger ending as she picks up a shotgun to face whatever undead threats come her way. As this is a Resident Evil movie, Anderson wanted to incorporate many elements and styles from the video games while having its own story. Anderson has stated that the camera angles and shots allude to the camera styles from the games. The close-up of Alice's eye opening up is a direct reference to the title screen of the first game. Other references in the movie's mansion scene include the crows flying away, weapons that are locked away and need a code, and a statue that appears similar to the one in the game as well. Once inside the hive, we have the infected dogs, which was a constant request of the fans. There's a train from Resident Evil 2. There's also a reference to Alice in Wonderland, being that the main character's name is Alice, and the Red Queen is a direct reference to the Queen of Hearts. Of course, this wouldn't be Resident Evil without the monsters, such as zombies. During production, professional dancers were hired for the zombies, as they had better control over their movements. Anderson told them to move however they thought a zombie would, given their conditions. While filming, there was a shortage of dancers to represent the required numbers of the undead, as scenes required large amounts of them. So, other crew members got to play them, such as several of the producers, including Jeremy Bolt. Even the presidents of both Capcom Japan and America got to play zombies. The visual effects for the monsters would be supervised by Richard Yurisic, who worked on Star Trek The Motion Picture and Blade Runner. He also worked with Paul on Event Horizon. The visual effects were done by Computer Film Company, which is owned by the creative studio Framestore, based in London. The film is a mix of computer-generated, animatronics, and miniatures. For the liquor that transforms, they created two large-scale puppets, one worn by a person, and the other had animatronics to give them more control over its movements. CG effects would be added on in post-production. For the infected dogs, it was a challenge applying makeup to them as they attempt to lick it off. For the close-up where Alice kicks one of them, they used a puppet. The laser hallway was the standout scene in this movie. For James's death, the team built an actual model of the actor and had it fall apart in sliced chunks. The CG effect for the death scene was done in post-production. For the movie's soundtrack, it was composed by Marco Beltrami and Marlon Manson. Paul Anderson explained on how he's a big fan of John Carpenter's score from his early films, such as Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween, and Escape from New York. He wanted to capture the spirit of those scores and provide an intense electro soundtrack for the movie. Marco was selected due to his work on Scream and Mimic. Interestingly enough, he's not a big fan of horror, yet he's always hired in that genre. Manson was excited to be a part of the production and wanted to provide his own take, different from his own songs. Paul thought these two musicians would complement each other with different styles. For instance, Manson would use heavy guitar elements for the introduction of the Umbrella Team and the fight with the zombies. Their more atmospheric moments would use melodic sound designs to enhance those scenes. The Red Queen had a childish waltz soundtrack, but it was enhanced to make it sound more menacing. Manson said he worked as a sound designer manipulating frequencies and recordings of instruments to get the effects he wanted. The main theme was created with the idea of Alice in Wonderland thrown into a world of decay and biological warfare. The theme is no doubt iconic for the movie and the series in general, so much so it became the unofficial theme for the COVID-19 outbreak. When the movie was released, it received mixed to negative reviews from both the critics and fans. One of the main complaints from the fans is that it wasn't based on the games, along with the lack of violence compared to the video games. There was also complaints on how not a single character from the games appeared in the movie. Despite the negative reviews, the movie would go on to make over $100 million on a budget of $33 million. This success would pave the way for multiple sequels, all of which were profitable. In 2021, the series would eventually get a reboot. From the looks of it, it might be a faithful adaptation of the games. In 2004, Resident Evil Apocalypse would be released, and it looks like an actual adaptation, based on Resident Evil 3 Nemesis and introducing the characters from the games, like Jill Valentine and Carlos Oliviar. Nemesis is actually one of the main villains in this movie, 
so in a way, it looked like the series was moving in the right direction. But Resident Evil Extinction came out in 2007 and pretty much dropped the ball. With each sequel being released, it had less to do with horror and the plot from the games, steering the movies into a more actionized genre. The same thing could be said with the Fast and the Furious franchise, with the sequels that are less about street racing and more about saving the world. So how does the film fare nowadays? While it's not a direct adaptation of the games, it does capture the spirit of the video game franchise, while having its own story, incorporating many elements from the games. Paul was trying to create a story that worked within the Resident Evil universe, and for that he did a good job. Same thing can't be said for the sequels after Apocalypse, unfortunately. Even fans now would agree that, compared to those movies, this one is actually not that bad. For one, it doesn't have the over-the-top action scenes the sequels have, or any of the ridiculous editing and constant jump cuts. There was a sense of dread, a sense of horror and hopelessness as the characters went deeper into the hive. The same thing could be said when it came to the ending of the film. 